We could be about to see a booster static fire in Starbase this week, but which booster? And when? Meanwhile, SpaceX continues to dismantle the high bay to prepare for construction of its replacement, Gigabay. Pad B work continues as the chopsticks complete testing milestones, and SpaceX fires up parts of the Pad B tank farm for the first time. Howdy, Star Tankers. I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. Let's start this week off with high bay demolition. This is a slow process, as crews are using an LTM 11,200 mobile crane to take it apart piece by piece. So far, a couple of roof wall sections have been cut off the building and lowered to the ground for further scrapping. Because of how it was built, this top bit is the most tricky part to demo. Once the roof and concrete floor is gone, the scrapping should go a bit faster, with the crane removing larger sections. If you remember with the mid-bay, the structure was first weakened before it was then pulled over in one spectacular smash. However, it's not clear that the high bay will follow a similar pattern. Why? Well, these days there is a very limited amount of space at the production site, which I may remind you, is still, you know, an active rocket factory, and the high bay is even bigger than the mid bay. So maybe SpaceX will just have to take it apart piece by piece. It is possible that once enough height has been taken off of the high bay, the rest might just be dropped onto the Stargate building. Which would be pretty cool. You know the drill, though. We'll have to wait and see exactly what happens. It's going to take slightly longer for us to find out, though, because during the week, the demolition operations were suspended and the crane was laid down thanks to incoming severe storms, which dropped several inches of water across the Rio Grande Valley. This caused massive flooding in the area, including some at Starbase. Here, we can see a shelf cloud rolling through Starbase, Port Isabel, and South Padre Island. Along with this mantling high bay, crews have been building a new external wall inside of Star Factory to close off the hilariously but unsurprisingly short-lived entrance wedge for demolition. All of this is for the new Giga Bay we've talked about in previous episodes which is SpaceX's next generation production and servicing facility. As a reminder, Gigabay will have space for 24 vehicles, at least if the Starbase Gigabay is sized the same as the one at Roberts Road in Florida. This is compared to the Megabay's five-ish spaces. Technically, SpaceX can fit six boosters in Megabay 1, but they don't actually have six workstations. The demolition of High Bay, Stargate, and the part of the Star Factory will take some time to complete. Then, crews will start drilling pilings for Gigabay, just like what has been started at Roberts Road. SpaceX says their target for completion of Gigabay is the end of 2026. Staying at the production site, we have some ship news, which we don't get to see much of anymore, with all of it happening either inside of Mega Bay 2 or inside of the Star Factory. This week, Ship 37's forward dome section was rolled into Mega Bay 2 for stacking. Usually, from forward dome to finish and stacking for Block 2 ships takes around three weeks or so. However, Ship 37's aft could be delayed for a while if SpaceX needs to make any changes to it based on learnings from the back-to-back -back failures of Ship 33 and Ship 34. It's possible Ship 37 doesn't get completed for another two months or so, but really, who knows what SpaceX is cooking inside of Star Factory right now? The answer is only SpaceX. Maybe NASA. Next up after Ship 37 is, you guessed it, Ship 38, which has had its nose cone stacked on its payload bay inside the Star Factory. And once again, just like with Ship 37, it has no forward flaps and it also has barely any tiles at all. Looking at Ship 36, Ship 37, and Ship 38, SpaceX has done almost no tiling. They've added all the pins, felt, mesh, and ablative, but no tiles. It's pretty obvious they were hoping to have re-entry data from a Block 2 ship by now to possibly try more experiments and try changes to the heat shield, but the back-to-back -back failures have absolutely had an impact on future ship production. And I gotta say, despite both of the recent failures not being a result of tile issues, I am really starting to wonder if ceramic tile-based TPS is ultimately a dead end. But I digress. It's a real shame SpaceX didn't get any precious re-entry data from the last two flights. Speaking of future ships, I bet everyone is asking, where is Ship 39? The last ship locks header tank we saw was way back in December of 2024, and that header tank is currently installed in Ship 38. Since then, we haven't seen a new one on the stands inside the factory through the windows. Other photographers have captured parts of a nose cone, and maybe it's methane header tank, but not having a nose cone on the heat shield pin install stand is odd. There are a few possible reasons for this. One could be that Ship 39 is a different variant of ship, like, say, a tanker version, since we know they're going to need to start flying that soon for Artemis and to get to Mars. Or it could be a Block 3 ship, 
which could mean an even more extended or stretched ship. If it is a Block 3 ship, it's probably delayed a bit due to the issues with Block 2 and the resulting lack of flight test data. Of course, this is all speculation, and all the primary construction of the ship is happening where we can't see it. Then we get to Ship 35, which came back from cryoproof testing a little over two weeks ago. And if we go by the timeline for Ship 34, it should be ready for a static fire sometime in the next week or two. But since it's inside Mega Bay 2 and in the front right corner, we can't get a view of it unless it comes out for testing or flight. It's going to be even harder to get updates on vehicles once the Gigabay is built, but that's the way she goes. Next to Ship 38 is some interesting hardware to say the least. What the heck is this thing? Okay, well, let's take a look at what we see and figure out what makes the most sense. It appears that the tank is roughly three and a half meters wide, which tracks with the current size of the booster header tank. And it also tracks with the possible header tank test article seen being tested at McGregor. So it could be a Block 2 booster header tank test article. Indeed, if we look at the area that has stringers on this new tank, it closely resembles the horizontal and vertical stringers used on the possible header tank test article. Now as to why it has a few rings attached above it with an attach point for an actuator, this would be for testing side loads on the tank as it sits inside a Block 2 aft section. Yeah, the thinking is that this tank could be sitting inside a Block 2 booster aft test tank of its own. Looking over at the Massey's test cage, SpaceX has added 33 hydraulic rams to the inside of the test cage, which would be used to simulate the forces of 33 Raptors against the thrust structure. SpaceX has also added several actuators on the second level of the test stand, which should line up with the attach point currently on this test article. There's only one attach point on this tank right now, but more could be added, so it will be something we watch out for. Of course, again, this is all speculation, and we have to wait for this thing to roll out to see what exactly it entails, but it's expected that SpaceX will test a Block 2 booster aft section, and eventually a Block 2 booster forward as well. For SpaceX, the clock is seriously ticking on getting a Block 2 booster ready to fly, or even just getting one ready to be stacked. Currently, SpaceX has four boosters for flight. That's boosters 14, 15, 16, and 17. Of course, 14 and 15 have already flown, 16 is getting its engines, and 17 still needs a cryogenic proof test. But so far, there's no sign of booster 18. If it were still a block one, it would likely have started to be stacked at this point. It really does seem like ship 39 and booster 18 are going to be the first stack used for pad B, considering neither have started stacking. And it is possible that the first ship that flies off of pad B is a block three ship. Yet again, wild speculation, but something fishy is going on with the construction of these vehicles. Now let's talk about launch pad B, where SpaceX has made some decent progress this week. As mentioned last week, crews poured the bottom floor of the flame trench, but not the ramps, which on its own took around 300 trucks of concrete. This week, crews have seemed to have poured the east ramp and will likely pour the west ramp soon. This took around 40 to 50 trucks to pour, but it's a lot harder to track with all of the concrete trucks needed at the launch site. This is only a few of the several separate concrete pours that crews have to make before installing a launch mount, which is still being worked on over at the Sanchez lot. As part of this process, the flame trench wall pieces are being installed. Now, these will be lowered down and look to be bolted down to the embeds that were welded to the rebar before the concrete pour occurred. Embeds are pieces of prefabricated steel that are cast into the concrete for attaching other components. The bolted ones are only for the bottom pieces, and the ones going up the wall will just be welded to each other. It's looking like there will be at least four rows going up to build the entire wall. Once the main wall is built, crews will fill the wall with concrete and then fill behind the wall with concrete as well. This will fill the gap between the main steel wall and the sheet piles. Once all of this is completed, crews should be able to install the launch mount. However, getting all of these wall pieces delivered and then welded together will take time. And while SpaceX wants Pad B operational as soon as possible, they don't have a booster to fly out of it. Speaking of the launch mount, it's still being worked on over at the Sanchez lot and currently does not even have hold down arms, at least as far as we know. Next door to the orbital launch mount is the pair of flame deflectors that will be placed inside the flame trench once everything is ready. Over the past few weeks, crews have been drilling holes into the pipes that make up the deflector. These holes will spray water out at high pressure, thus suppressing sound and protecting the deflector and trench itself from the power of 33 Raptor engines. As for other parts of Pad B, the chopsticks performed two movement tests over this past week, slewing side to side. 
Each time the chopsticks move, they seem to go a little bit faster. These tests are being done now because the Pad B chopstick actuators are finally fully hooked up, and SpaceX is performing calibration tests with the hardware and software. With the sticks going up to the top of the tower and getting slew testing done this week, up next would be load testing with the water bags and high-speed movement testing. Oh, and these arms still need their stabilizer arms installed on them. Nearby, at the water deluge tank farm for Pad B, crews received another water deluge tank this week, bringing the total to nine tanks. This latest one fills up all of the smaller tank locations, and there is still an opening for a fifth larger tank, but so far we haven't seen evidence of it arriving. Now, just as the chopsticks hit a milestone this week, so did the tank farm. Over the past few months, crews have been installing all of the valve skids, pump stands, cryo pumps, and all of the piping for Pad B's tank farm. And this week, some of it was tested for the very first time. Early in the week, SpaceX spun up a single liquid oxygen pump to test a few of the lines and the new exhaust fan system for this tank farm. To start off in the testing, we can see a small plume of gas being pushed up. This is the new grass vent for this tank farm. Now, some of you are probably asking, what does the grass vent at Pad A signify? I can hear Adrian right now saying, NOTHING! Well, that signals the initial chill down of lines from the tanks to the pumps and allows for the excess liquid nitrogen or liquid oxygen to be dumped into the grass, hence the name grass vent. So the plume that can be seen is part of a new exhaust system so that SpaceX isn't just dumping liquid nitrogen out into the air. This uses a pair of fans. Remember when those were delivered and we were like, uh, okay, what are these for? These pull air into a duct that is pointed up. Then the exhaust from the subcoolers and the chill down vent are routed into that duct. So when the fans are on and the vents are venting into the duct, the liquid nitrogen gets mixed with the air, which dilutes it. This then creates a column of gas that looks like a steam engine from a train while the subcoolers run. The one we see running here is likely only for the liquid oxygen side of the tank farm, as the liquid methane side has barely been built up yet, since parts are still being delivered. But seeing at least two of the exhaust systems running at full power with 17 pumps and about 20 subcoolers worth of exhaust will be really neat. We say 20 subcoolers worth because the bigger subcoolers are worth about four of the smaller ones. Yeah, SpaceX is not playing around when it comes to the capability of Pad B's tank farm. Then, just a few days after testing just a single pump, SpaceX tested two liquid oxygen pumps. This time, even more items were tested. There's a new vent near the newer vertical tanks in the back that was turned on for the first time, and it looks like crews even tested one of the vertical tanks as well. This test was done to verify systems installed so far to make sure everything works the way it should before proceeding with installation of the rest of the tank farm equipment. There is still a lot that has to be installed and we'll be here watching it along with you as it happens. Now, let's jump over to the Kennedy Space Center and Launch Complex 39A, where crews are still driving in sheet piles for the flame trench there. These sheet piles help keep the surrounding ground from collapsing into the trench once the trench is dug out. The flame trench at LC-39A is about eight months behind the flame trench at Pad B in Starbase, Texas. After the sheet piles are installed, then comes jet grouting. God, that sounds cool. Where crews will create a sort of floor for the trench that they can dig down to once they get to that point in construction. It also helps with preventing water from seeping up and into the trench once they dig it out. After that, crews start to dig out the trench and then begin to add in tiebacks, which are cables that are drilled diagonally into the sheet piles and into the ground to hold the sheet piles against the dirt. Once that is completed, crews can then fully dig out the trench and crush the tops off the piles that were installed and then tie those in with massive rebar cages to form the floor and ramps of the trench. Then, embeds will be installed to the rebar cages so that the flame trench steel walls can be bolted down and installed just like what is happening right now at Pad B. It's super cool that we get a sort of preview of what will happen at 39A by watching what's going on in Starbase. All right, it's time to address the big question of the week. When booster static fire? And perhaps more importantly, which booster? Well, during the week, a new pair of road closures went out, which stated non-flight testing to occur on April 3rd with a backup day on April 4th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time. These are likely for a booster static fire test as the booster transport stand was moved into the ring yard awaiting a booster. As for what booster will be static fired? Well, booster 15 is sitting outside already on a stand, but is missing engines, so that's out of the running. Booster 17 hasn't even completed a cryogenic proof test yet, which isn't a surprise given that it just finished stacking earlier this month. Booster 16 just got back from cryogenic proof testing and has been in Mega Bay 1 for about a week. However, the quickest SpaceX has been able to go from cryo proof test of a booster to static fire is 44 days. So that leaves booster 14-2, which has been inside of Mega Bay 1 since January 17th. 
the day after it first flew. This would be kind of a big deal. Early in the morning on Tuesday, without a published road delay beforehand, Booster 14-2 emerged from Mega Bay 1 and rolled to the launch site. Just a few hours later, the chopsticks engaged and the vehicle was lifted onto the orbital launch mount. This all but confirms that we're about to see the first static fire of a flight-proven super heavy booster. Yet another step in the right direction toward a rapidly reusable future. Assuming everything goes well, B-14-2 will likely get used on Starship Flight 9, as it is the quickest path to flight over Booster 16, which, again, could have around four more weeks of work left before it's ready to perform a static fire. Granted, we don't have X-ray vision and don't know what SpaceX is planning, so take all of this with a grain of salt as usual. We're just reading the Starbase tea leaves and telling you what we see. In that same vein, SpaceX may not go straight to a static fire on Booster 14. Since this is the first time they will ever test a flown Super Heavy booster, any kind of testing is on the table. It wouldn't be that much of a surprise if SpaceX did a propellant load test to re-verify the tanks on Booster 14, then complete a spin prime test to verify the engine plumbing. And once all of that is completed, then they might static fire the booster. But as always, it's SpaceX, and they could just YOLO it and static fire it straight away. We don't know. Now, as for the pad that Booster 14 would do this testing on, Pad A refurbishment had an interesting thing happen this week where crews seemed to have removed an entire holddown arm before either replacing it or reinstalling it. This is something we really haven't seen them do before, but this pad has been through eight full stack launches and is kind of the beta test pad more than anything. Pad A hasn't only had refurbishment done to it recently, this week crews added what looks to be a high pressure gas line to the backside of the tower. This line goes all the way up the ship quick disconnect area and then gets routed toward the ship quick disconnect itself. This could be SpaceX trying to add a carbon dioxide purge system to the ship over the nitrogen system they had introduced on ship 34. Or it could be something else entirely. We're not sure. If it is related to the purge system changes, then it makes sense that SpaceX would want another try at mitigating the leak issue from Flight 7. And I want to be clear here. I'm not sure Flight 8 suffered from the exact same issue as Flight 7. As far as I know, all we know publicly is that both issues happened around the same time in flight. Has it ever actually been confirmed that Flight 7 and Flight 8 suffered the exact same failure? If I'm forgetting something, let me know in the comments. Anyway, these potential purge changes, if that's what they are, in combination with whatever learnings and subsequent modifications result from Flight 8, will hopefully get Ship 35 past second stage engine cutoff so SpaceX can get controlled re-entry data on Block 2. Like we said earlier, this is super important. After all, the entire iterative design cycle hinges on flight data. SpaceX has barely tiled any of the newer Block 2 ships, and this could be because they don't have the data they want in order to proceed with that part of assembly. In other news this week, Starship was added to the list of rockets that SpaceX can use to bid for NASA launch service provider contracts. No, this does not mean Starship is considered an operational rocket, but for example, New Glenn got added to the launch service or provider list back in 2020. And as we all know, it didn't even fly until 2025. It just means they can use it to bid for those contracts once an RFP or request for proposal comes out for a certain mission. There are a few NASA missions that don't have launch vehicles yet, but aren't expected to fly for a while anyway. This is super exciting because it's an important step toward hardware designers and mission managers being able to think about large diameter payloads that only Starship could lift. This addition by NASA is also a good thing for Starship in that it shows confidence in the system going forward. Yes, the Starship program has had some setbacks lately with Ship 34 and Ship 33, but it shows that NASA has confidence that the teams at SpaceX will figure it out and get Starship to become a reliable rocket. And frankly, so do we here at NSF, at least I do anyway. SpaceX already has commercial contracts and the human landing system contract, which is probably their biggest overall for the program, in addition to their internal manifest of Starlink launches. But being able to bid Starship for LSP contracts is a super neat development. You can stay up to date as usual by following us on your social platform of choice. Despite all the chaos in the world these days, at least we all still get to sit back and watch the future become real before our eyes. And our various socials, X, Insta, Blue Sky, are a great place for that. As always, thanks for watching, and don't forget, be excellent to each other.